In this video, we're going to discuss the solutions to the final exam on probability and statistics in spring semester 2019. Exam contains two parts. Part 1 contains six conceptual questions, and part 2 contains eight problems on the following topics. So let's start with the first part. It has five conceptual questions. The first question is on the probability mass function. We need to find the value of the C so that this table becomes a proper mass function. And we know that the table becomes a proper table when the sum of all the probabilities is equal to the 1. So basically c plus 1 over t plus 1 over 5 plus 1 over 10 plus 1 over 10 is equal to the 1. So let me rewrite those ratios in a decimal form. It's going to be 0 0.5 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 and the sum they gave me as 0 0.9. So c plus 0 0.9 is equal to the 1. So that is why the value of the c so that the sum becomes 1 is equal to the 0 0.1. In a second problem, we're given three different probability mass functions. We need to order them from the biggest to the smallest in the deviations. So for the first one, so the frequencies are the same. It may be considered as a constant, right? So it means that the standard deviation is equal to the zero, the variance is equal to the zero. And so here, when, it, when we compare the B part and the C part, I see that the variance is bigger on the C part because the points are more spread around the mean than in the B part. So that is why the biggest standard deviation goes to the C, the second biggest is on the B, and the smallest one is on the A because it is equal to the zero, simply. Problem number three, we're given a claim, and we need to identify what is the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. So the claim is the mean temperature of a body is equal to the set of 6.6. .6. So this is given mu is equal to the set of 6.6. .6. This is the null hypothesis because it has the equality sign, and it's complement, which is mu is not equal to the set of 6.6, .6, is going to be the alternative hypothesis. Problem number four, so the alternative hypothesis of some claim is given as p is not equal to the 0 0.25. We're given the test statistic, and we need to evaluate what is the p-value. So the p-value is, depending on the test, it's going to be the area on one tail or in both of the tails. So since the alternative hypothesis is is given as p is not equal to the 0 0.25, we're going to use the GTL test. Basically, the p value is going to be the areas on both of the tails. And the test statistic is going to be minus 1.23 and 1.23. So basically, I need to find one of the areas and multiply this to the t. So let me evaluate the area of phi of minus 1.23. So this function gives me the area under the standard normal distribution curve until this point, until minus 1.23. And I can find this as subtracting 1 from the 1 minus 1.23, right? So I can find a value of the phi 1.23 from the table. This is going to be 0 0.83. And if I subtract this from the 1, it's going to be 0 0.11. So this area is equal to the 0 0.11. So this area is going to be 0 0.11. So in total, p value is going to be roughly 0 0.22. So problem number 5, t events are given. Suppose the probability near the event happens is 3 over 7. What is the probability that at least one event occurs? So probability that neither event happens, it means A doesn't happen, right? So the probability that A doesn't happen, where A event, it's, it's a complement, and B doesn't happen, is equal to the 3 over 7. So the complement of the A prime and B prime, if I take a complement, it's going to be equal to the A or B, right? So basically... The at least one event occurs, it means A or B, which is the complement of this one. So that is why probability of A or B is equal to the 4 over 7. Basically, probability of A or B is equal to the 1 minus probability of the A prime and B prime. So the last problem here in this section is basically we need to check whether this statement is true or false. So basically it looks like 
as the central limit theorem. So we're given n random variables which are independent. They might have any distribution, exponential, Poisson, or binomial distribution. For large enough value for the n, the summation of all of these random variables has a normal distribution. So if I denote this random variable, the summation as x, then this is going to have the normal distribution with the mean n multiplied to the, the mean of one of the random variables, and the variance is going to be equal to the n multiplied to the variance of one of the random variables. So this is true, and we're going to use the statement in one of the problems in the second part. So let's start with the first sec first problem of the second part. We're given six data points. We are going to calculate this numerical values. So let's start with the a part. We just need to calculate the mean, which is the summation of all of the data points divided to the six. So x bar is going to be equal to the 51 plus 63 plus 36 plus 43 plus 34 plus 36 divided to the six, which is equal to the 43.8, roughly. So the B part is we need to evaluate the standard deviation, which can be evaluated as so xi minus x bar. So I need to subtract the mean from each of the data values, and I need to square those differences, and I need to sum them and divide this as n minus 1. Then I need to take the square root of this. So let me first of all evaluate the x i minus x bar and its summation in the square. So if I subtract 43.8 from the 51, it's going to be equal to 7.2 in the square. If I do this with the 63, it's going to be 19.2 in the square. Let's do this for all the other values. So if I sum all of these values, it's going to be 638.8 roughly. And the standard deviation is going to be equal to 638.8 divided to the n minus 1, which is 5 from the square root, which is equal to 11.34. So C part is we need to find the mode. So mode is the value, which has the highest frequency. From here, I see that set of, set of 6 appears in our data set twice. Its frequency is the highest frequency, so that is why the mode is equal to the set of 6, because it has a frequency 2. And in order to find a median, we need to sort all of these data points in increasing or decreasing order. So if I sort them in increasing order, for example, it can be written as set of 4, set of 6, set of 6, 43, 51, and 63. Then I'm going to take the, oops, so there are six data points, right? So that is why I'm going to take the average of the two values which are in the middle. So this is the median. It's going to be equal to the set of 6 plus 43 over 2, which is equal to 39.5. If I would have odd number of the data points, then the median would be exactly value in the middle. So let's go with the second problem. So we are given this problem. This is exactly, actually, an example of negative binomial distribution. A utility company calculates that there is a probability of 82% that the customer service resolves the problem within two hours. And we, we, are like, we would like to estimate the probability that six problem on a day is the second problem that cannot be resolved it was in two hours. So basically, we've got a formula for the negative binomial distribution where uh, x is the number of the trials when we are have fixed number of the successful trials is equal to combination of the k minus 1, r minus 1, p in the power of r, q in the power of k minus r, right? So in our case, we are going to find, like define, uh, if the problem is not resolved, this is going to be a successful case, right? Because we need to find a second problem which is not resolved, right? Second successful trial in the sixth trial. So number of the trials, k is equal to the six. Number of the successful trials, r is equal to the t. We consider success when the problem is not resolved, right? And the probability of this event is going to be equal to the combination of the five and one. So what is the probability that the problem is not resolved? 
probability that the problem is not resolved is equal to the 0 0.18, right? And the power of t multiplied to the 0 0.82 to the power of 4. If I evaluate this, it's going to be equal to 0 0.0732. So this is the prob probability that sixth problem of the day is the second problem, which is not resolved. Problem number three is the is about the con continuous random variables. So a test grade of a students, which is the random variable, has the scale from zero to the one, and students has to get zero point fifty five in order to pass the exam. So if I choose one of the students randomly, what is the probability that he passes the exam? It is basically if I choose one of the students, what is the probability that his grade is more than 0 0.55. In order to evaluate this, we need to integrate the density function from 0 0.55 until 1. And I see that this is, so the density function is equal to this value when the x is more than 0 0.5 and less than 1. So this is going to be integration of 4 minus 4x dx. So if I find the antiderivative, it's going to be equal to the 4x minus dx squared. And we need to evaluate its values at the 1 and 0 0.55. So if I put 1, it's going to be equal to the 4 minus t. If I put 0 0.55, it's going to be equal to the minus 4 multiplied to the 0 0.55 minus t multiplied to the 0 0.55 in the square. So if I calculate this, it's going to be equal to the 0 0.4050. So in the second part of this problem, we need to evaluate the expected value of the random variable x, or average score of a student is going to be equal to the expectation of the x. It's the integration of the x multiplied to the density function dx. And we are going to integrate this from minus infinity to the plus infinity, or we can split this into the two parts according to the intervals of the density function. So basically, I'm going to integrate this from zero to the one over t when x is multiplied to the four x, which is going to be four x squared dx, plus integration from one over t until one of x multiplied to the four minus four x, which is four x minus four x squared dx. So the integration of the first part is going to be equal to the four x cubed we need to integrate this from 0 to the 1 over t. The antiderivative of the second part is going to be equal to the 4x squared right, over t, or simply which is going to be equal to the tx squared minus 4x cubed over 3. Here I have 3 as well. So we need to evaluate this at the 1 in 1 over t. So let us put the values. So if I put 1 over t, it's going to be 4 multiplied as a 1 over 8 over 3 plus so if I put the 0, it's going to be simple 0. So now let me put 1, it's going to be t minus 4 over 3 minus, now I need to substitute 1 over t with the x, it's going to be t multiplied to the 1 over 4 minus 4 multiplied to the 1 over 8 over 3. Simply this is going to be equal to the 1 over 6, right? So 4 multiplied to the 1 over 8 is 1 over t. And t goes down, it's going to be 1 over 6 plus t minus 4 over 3 is going to be equal to the t over 3 minus 1 over t plus 1 over 6 again. So if I add 1 over 6 to the 1 over 6, it's going to be t over 6 or simply 1 over 3. If we add this to the t over 3, it's going to be equal to the 1. So the 3 terms is going to give me 1 minus 1 over t. It's going to be equal to the 1 over t. So the expected value, the average score of student is equal to the 0 0.5. And in a C part, we need to get a cumulative distribution function x, which is the probability that random variable is less or equal than small x, right? So basically, the density function, it looks like a triangular function, and we need to split again the cumulative distribution function into the four parts, actually. So for all the values of the x less than 0, it's the cumulative distribution function is equal to the 0. For values of the x between 0 and 1 over t, the cumulative distribution function is going to be e equal to the integration of the density function. Let me write this with a t from 0 until the x. So this is going to be equal to the integration from 0 to the x, 4t dt. If I integrate this, it's going to be 2t squared, right? 2t squared 
from 0 to the x. If I substitute the x, it's going to be 2x squared. So for the values of the x between 1 over t and 1, the cumulative distribution function is going to be equal the integration from 1 over t until x of the f of t, which is equal to the 4 minus 4t in this case, dt. If I find antiderivative, it's going to be 4t minus t t squared. I'm going to put the x in 1 over t. If I put the x, it's going to be equal to the 4x minus tx squared. If I put the 1 over t, it's going to be equal to the minus 4 multiplied to the 1 over t minus t multiplied to the 1 over 4. Okay, so I can you can simplify this. And for values of the x bigger than 1, the cumulative distribution function, which is the integration of the density function, right, from any value which is bigger than 1, it's going to be equal to the 1, right? Here, if I put the x, for any value of the x, it's going to be bigger than 1, right? So the this is going to be integration or the area under the whole region of the distribution density function, which is equal to the 1. So for all the values of the x less than 0, so that the density function is, is equal to the 0 simply. The cumulative distribution function, sorry. Problem number four is on the likelihood functions in maximum likelihood estimates. We are given the data points three, five, and seven. Suppose also that observations follow the distribution with the following probability density function, and we need to estimate the parameter t. So if the observations follow, we've got exactly 3, 5, and 7, and they've got the following distribution. So I need to just multiply f of 3, f of 5, and f of 7 in order to get exactly those results. So this is going to be equal to the 3t in the power of minus 3t over t multiplied to the 5t in the power of minus 5t over t multiplied to the 7t in the power of minus 7t over t. So this is the likelihood function. So in order to estimate the maximum likelihood function, it is better for us to take its logarithm. So logarithmic likelihood function, it's a ln of 3 multiplied to the 5, multiplied to the 7, multiplied to the t cube, e in the power of, if I multiply this e, this e, and this e, I can just sum the powers, right? I can write this minus 3 plus 5 plus 7 t over t. If I take the ln, I can write this as the ln of 3 multiplied to the 5 multiplied to the 7 plus a ln of t cube plus a ln of e and a power of minus 15 t over t, right? If I simplify this, this is going to be equal to the ln of some constant, which is 3, 5, and 7 plus 3 ln of t, because the power goes down here. And so ln of e is simply 1, so this power goes down. It's going to be minus 15 t over t. Okay, So this is, again, the logarithmic likelihood function. In order to find the t so that this function becomes maximum, I just need to take its derivative and equalize this to the 0. So let me take the derivative. The derivative of the first term is 0, because it's a constant. The derivative of the second term is 3 over t. And the derivative of the last term is equal to the 15 over t, right? Minus 15 over t is equal to the 0. And I can find the t from here. It's going to be equal to the t over 3 is equal to the t over 15. And I can cancel the 3 over this 15, and it's going to be equal to the t over 5, or 0 0.4, simply. So this is the maximum likelihood estimate for our problem. Problem number five. So we need to remember the theorem from the first part in order to solve this. So Mr. and Mrs. Smith have to pay one dollar for every minute of the tardiness when they uh, when they take their children from the daycare. For every minute they have to pay one dollar. So usually they are late for six minutes. 
in every day, and the number of the minutes, the amount of the time when they are late, has the exponential distribution. So the child will be in the daycare for estimate for 100 days. Estimate the probability that they will pay more than $630 of the late fees. So basically, they are late every day, different amount of the time, and this is the random variable, right? But in average, they are late for six minutes, okay? So let me denote the random variable x1, it's the amount of the time when they are late for the first day. So amount of the, then it has the exponential distribution with the parameter theta is equal to the six minutes, right? So the expected value of this x bar x1 is going to be equal to the 6, and the variance is going to be equal to the 36, so 6 in the square. So you can find those formulas at the end of the exam paper. So the amount of the time when the parents are late for the first day is x1. Amount of the time when they are late for the second day is, let's say, xt. It is going to have exactly the same probability density function, and so on. So the amount of the time when the parents are late for the day 100 is going to be x 100. All of those variables are random variables. So we need to sum them and we are, let's denote this as x. This is going to be a new random variable, which is the sum of 100 random variables. So according to the central limit theorem, this x is going to have the normal distribution with the mean and multiplied to the mean of each of the random variable, which is equal to the n, which is 100, multiplied to the 6, and with the variance is going to be equal to the n, which is 100, multiplied to the variance of each of the random variables, which is equal to the set of 6. So we've got this x, which is the sum of all the minutes which have been laid for 100 days, and it's going to have the normal distribution. So basically what we need to find is we need to find the probability that this x the sum of all the minutes would they have been late is more than 630 minutes, right? So I can evaluate this by evaluating 1 minus probability of x is less than 630. And let me evaluate this probability of x is less than 630 separately. Probability that x is less than 630, it's equal to the probability that the z is less than 630 sorry, equal, minus 600, right? Because the mean is going to be 600, divided to the standard deviation, right? Do you remember if the sigma is 100 multiplied to the set of 6, then the standard deviation is going to be 10 multiplied to the 6, okay? So this is going to be equal to the P of Z less or equal than 30 divided to the 60, or 1 over T. From the table, I just need to find a value of the phi of, 0.5. So if I find this, this is going to be equal to 0.69 and probability that the parents are going to pay more than $630, it's going to be equal to 1 minus 0.69 or roughly 0.31 because it has some numbers here as well. So probability that they're going to pay more than $630 in 100 days is equal to the state of 1%. And we use the central limit theorem in order to estimate this probability. Problem number six is on the hypothesis test. So you can use the uh, rejection regions or you can evaluate the p-value and compare this with the level of significance. So in a Gallup poll, 1,000 adults were randomly selected and asked if they were satisfied or dissatisfied with the amount of the leisure time they had. So from the sample of 1,000 people, 850 said yes, they are satisfied. So use 1% level of significance in order to test the claim that roughly 67% of the people, adults, are satisfied with the amount of the leisure time. So basically, so the claim is proportion of the population which are satisfied with the leisure time is 0.67. And this is going to be the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is P is not equal to the 0 0.67, and this is the first step. So second step is we are going to find a valid test statistic. So the test statistic in our case is equal to 
p hat minus p divided to the pq from the square root multiplied to the square root of n. So the p hat in our case is the proportion of a sample. So we take a sample of 1,000 people and 650 of them say that they are satisfied. They said yes, right? 650 successful cases and 1,000 trials. Basically, this is going to be equal to 0 0.65. So we need to put all the values here. It's going to be equal to 0 0.65 minus 0 0.67 divided to the square root of 0 0.67 multiplied to the 0 0.33 multiplied to the n, which is the square root of n, which is 10 because, uh, no, it's the square root of 1,000. Okay, so if I'm going to evaluate this, so if you evaluate the test statistic, this is going to be 0 0.34 roughly, right? So it means that if you're going to use the t-tail test, since the alternative hypothesis has inequality sign, this is going to be here 1.34, and this is minus 1.34. So if you find a value from the table, the area until 1.34 is 91%, roughly. So this is going to be 9% here. And this is also 9%. So the p-value is 18%, right? P-value is 18%. So in the problem, in the third part, we just need to compare the p-value, which is 18% with the level of significance, which is 1%. It means that the p-value is bigger than alpha, it means that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So our claim was the null hypothesis, so that is why we're going to support this, right? Or we basically say that there is not enough evidence to reject it. There is not enough evidence to reject the claim. There is not enough evidence to reject the claim. So problem number seven is on the conditional probability. There are three red balls and two black balls in the urn. So the ball, one of the balls are drawn randomly. If the ball is red, we kept out from the urn and we choose the second ball. If the ball is black, then we're going to put this black ball back to the Burn, and we're going to put one red ball additionally. So then we're going to choose the second one. So in A part, if we choose one of the balls, if this is red, right? First one is red. And so what is the probability that the first one is red and the second one is red, right? Second one is red when the first one is red. So this is going to be equal. First one is red, it's 3 over 5. And the second one is red when the first one is red is 2 over 4, right? Because when we choose the first one, if this is red, we don't put this back. And we're going to choose the second time from the urn where there are two red balls left and four balls in total are left. This is, this is going to be 6 over 20. So in a B part, is a little bit tricky. So if the second ball we choose is red, what is the probability that the first one is black? So we need to find the conditional probability that the second ball is red. What is the probability that the first one was black? So we are going to use the base theorem in order to solve this. So it is going to be equal to the probability that second one is red, first one is black, multiplied to the probability that the first one is black, divided to the probability that the second one is red. So let us evaluate the probability that the second one is red separately. So probability that the second ball is red is. So there are two cases when the second ball is red. The first one is when we choose the first one is red. And the second one is red when the first one is red. Or we choose the first one is black, right? And we multiply the probability of the, when we check the second ball, and this is red, and the first one is black. So we need to evaluate those probabilities. Probability that the first one is red is 3 over 5, and the probability that the second one is red when the first one is red is 2 over 4, as before, plus the so probability that the sec first one is black is 2 over 5, right? 
uh, and multiply it as a probability that the second one is red. Basically, if the first one is black, we are going to put this back. So there are two, three reds and two blacks. And additionally, we're going to put one more red. So there are going to be four reds and two blacks. So probability that we are going to choose the second time the red ball is going to be equal to the four over six because now we are going to have four red balls and six balls in total. So we just need to put all the numbers here. It's going to be equal to the three over five multiplied to the two over four, right? Or sorry, so two over five multiplied to the four over six divided to the three over five multiplied to the two over four plus two over five multiplied to the four over six. And we are going to have eight over 17 if I simplify all the numbers. So this is the probability of choosing, if, it cho if you choose the second ball and if you've got the red ball, this is the probability that the first one actually was the black. And the last problem is about the properties of the expected value and the variance. So we are given this T equation and we need to find the variance and the expected value. So we can open up the brackets inside. It's going to be expectation of the x squared minus tx plus 1. And this is equal to the 11. And the second equation can be written as x squared minus 4x plus 4. This is equal to the 6. So let's apply the expectation to each of the terms. It is going to be equal to the expectation of the x squared minus t if x is equal to 10 because the expectation of the 1 is going to be 1. If the 1 goes to the right, it's going to be simply 10. The expectation of the x squared minus 4, expectation of the x, right? Plus the expectation of the 4 is going to be simply 4. So if the 4 goes to the right, it's going to be simply 2, right? So let me subtract the first equation from the second. It is going to be so e of x squared minus t e of x minus e of x squared plus 4 e of x. So this is going to be equal to the 8. From here I can find it minus t of x and plus t e of x. It's going to be t e of x is equal to the 8 since this term and this term are going to be cancelled. And the expectation of the random variable is equal to the 4. So in order to find the expectation of the x squared, I can substitute this in one of the equations here. For example, to the first one, and I can find the expectation of the x squared is going to be equal to the t multiplied to the 4. If it goes to the right, it's going to be 18. So we know that the variance of a random variable can be found using this equation, e of x squared minus e of x in the square. This is going to be equal to the 18 minus 4 in the square, which is 16. This is going to be simply equal to the t. So the variance is equal to the t then the expected value is equal to the 4.